As Chris has already said, um, my ma the main focus of my work revolves around the physicochemical characterization of aluminium adjuvants and how these properties might influence the biology of the injection site. So my speciality is actually dynamic light scattering, so particle size. So what I'd like to show you today is some of the results that um, I've generated during my PhD um, of what happens to the um, particle size and the zeta potential of these materials as they are, well, undergo the progression from vaccine preparation to um, when they are administered into the intramuscular site of injection. So first of all, what I'd like to show you in these up and coming figures are actually what happens when you formulate the um, adjuvants in 0.9% sodium chloride, so physiological saline, and this is typical of what would actually happen when uh, commercial vaccines are prepared. Um, I would like to also state before I um, show you these um, images, well, figures, that um, the model I'm actually using uh, contains 0.25 milligram per mil of aluminium. And this is typically at the lower end that's accepted within commercial vaccines. Also, these models are actually formulated without antigen. So we're really looking at the journey um, of what happens to the aluminium at the injection site. So first of all, this is um, the hydrodynamic particle size of the three adjuvants chosen for study. So alhydrogel, adjufos, which are both commercial uh, adjuvants, and the inject alum, which again is the research preparation. Um, and this was done via dynamic light scattering. So really the main take home message from this slide is that adjufos has um, a greater proportion of larger particles than alhydrogel. And just to give you more detail about this figure, you can see that the interquartile range, which are the red boxes um, of the size, is actually quite narrow for alhydrogel. And this means typically, or this infers from the DLS, that this is actually a more monodisperse adjuvant. With regards to adjuvos, you can see that the interquartile range is much uh, larger and so therefore, it is more polydispersed. It has more particles of different sizes within it. Alhydrogel typically um, has a medium particle size of approximately one micron, just over one micron. And while Adjufos has a medium particle size of just over four, sorry, three. And inject alum is approximately uh, just under one micron. So really, all of the adjuvants here are quite different uh, in their particle size distribution. So moving on, what we were actually trying to achieve with this figure here is we were trying to look at the recovery of aluminium. So we were actually looking at the whole of the sample here. So what we did is we actually um, selectively filtered these uh, preparations and then analyzed um, the recoveries um, using graphite furnace atomic absorption spectroscopy. And so what we see here for al hydrogel is that most of the particles are under 2.7 micron in size, which kind of correlates with what the DLS is showing. Adjufos, however, has a larger proportion of particles which are above 5.6 micron. And I should state at this point that that is the limit of what DLS can measure. So there's actually quite a lot um, of the sample that's being missed via DLS. So that's why this particular form of characterization is so essential. Inject alum, again, similar to alhydrogel. And these are both aluminium hydroxide-based adjuvants, but again, inject alum is amorphous, and alhydrogel is crystalline, and I can show you some images um, in the next couple of slides which show this. So this is a TEM image of alhydrogel formulated in the saline. And you can see here, the main characteristics of this adjuvant is that it's crystalline. It actually has nano needles, so it means that it's poorly crystalline, as opposed to having kind of plate-like structures which are more crystalline. And you can see here, actually, the polydispersity of this adjuvant. You have quite a proportion of the material that's in these small aggregates, um, approximately one to two micron in size. And you also have some material, some aggregates that are actually smaller than this. But you also have this huge entity here, which has the evidence of being porous. 
and this is in the order of 8 microns. So this really kind of relates to what we see with both methods of particle size characterization, so the DLS and the graphite furnace uh, recoveries. Moving on to the Agifos, you can see the distinct difference in the morphology for Agifos. Agifos is actually made up um, of a platy-like structure. So the plates, the individual little kind of plates, are actually in the order of 50 nanometers. And these come together in the sodium chloride to form aggregates. And this aggregate, this particular aggregate, is approximately 3 micron in size, and this is typically what we would see for uh, Agifos itself. And I should also state that Agifos is also amorphous. <coughs> Moving on to inject alum, this actually has two morphologies um, within it. So you can see here that these plate-like structures here are basically really highly crystalline brucite, so magnesium hydroxide. And you can also see the aluminium hydroxycarbonate here, which is a more amorphous phase. And the, this is typical of what you would see for inject alum. Inject alum is in the order of about one micron. Um, it produces one micron aggregates when formulated in sodium chloride. So for the zeta potential results now, um, this basically shows um, the surface charge of the adjuvant. So you can see there is a distinct difference between our hydrogel and agifos. Our hydrogel is positively charged, agifos is negatively charged, and inject alum is also negatively charged. So these, this really is significant in terms of protein adsorption when you're formulating a vaccine. So our hydrogel will form the greatest affinity with negatively charged proteins, while agifos and inject alum will form the affinity with positively charged proteins. So what happens to the vaccine preparations when you administer them into a formulation which mimics um, interstitial fluids? So this, in this case, it would be R10 medium. In R10 medium, this is our, for our hydrogel, this is a DLS. Um, hydrodynamic particle size of our hydrogel, you can see there's some evidence of aggregation. You can see the interquartile range, highlighted in red, is actually getting broader. So this solution is becoming more polydispersed over time. And the increase is really only significant over zero to one hours. But again, this is because of protein adsorption. And the protein adsorption occurs relatively rapidly upon introduction. Again, looking at the recoveries, this is really echo, these results really echo in the DLS. And you can see that the major population at zero hours is actually below 2.7 micro. And this actually doesn't change too much um, during the first hour of incubation, but you do get a drop off in the population between 5.6 micron and 2.7 micron. However, at 24 hours, you see a resurgence in the populations that are above 5.6 micron. And this may account for some of the results that we um, generated using the DLS towards the latter time points. This is a TEM image uh, showing our hydrogel when it has been incubated for zero hours in our 10 medium. So the major component, the proteinaceous component of um, our 10 medium is actually bovine serum albumin, so this is negatively charged. And so you can expect that the positively charged al hydrogel here has actually um, accumulated a large protein corona. So this makes the entire aggregate in the order of three or four microns. So it really does increase the size. You can also see that the fibrillar morphology that's so distinctive to al hydrogel is actually more muted in this situation. So this is also characteristic of surface absorption of the protein. Looking again at the zeta potential results, if you remember from previous figures that our hydrogel was positively charged and now it has become negatively charged, so there's been a massive change in the surface potential of this adjuvant. So as we can see, there's not really much change from zero to 24 hours, and this is because protein absorption actually occurs um, most significantly with almost instantaneously when the material is administered. Moving on to Agifos, the results for the DLS of Agifos actually show a slight disaggregation, which is quite strange considering that protein absorption, which we know that Agifos also absorbs proteins from the R10 medium, um, it would make the aggregates larger. However, this isn't the case on the DLS, and this is because a lot of the particles have become so large that they have sedimented and DLS actually misses them. 
And this is really echoed in the recoveries. So here we're measuring the entirety of the sample. So for Agifos results, the actual the population above 5.6 micron is actually the predominant population. And this really continues over um, 24 hours. So this is the predominant population here. Again, with the TEM, this is Agifos in the R10 medium after zero hours. And you can see this very large, extensive aggregate. And this is typical of what we see for Agifos. And it, would also, it also very nicely backs up what we see with the uh, graphite furnace recoveries. And you can also see some evidence in these pores of entrapment, protein entrapment. And this has also been identified as a common mechanism by which Agifos actually um, takes proteins out of uh, solutions and uh, protein adsorption. Again, this is echoed w really particularly with the zeta potential because Agifos starts off as being negatively charged. And really, there's not much difference um, between the vaccine formulation and the... Um, the R10 medium when it's first administered. So this really means that perhaps a lot of the protein absorption does not happen at the surface of the adjuvant, that the uh, protein's actually entrapped within the adjuvant material itself. Moving on to inject alum. Inject alum remains relatively stable in terms of particle size, perhaps experiencing a slight disaggregation at the latter time points. However, this is again due to uh, some sedimentation. And this, again, is shown with the graphite furnace uh, recoveries. You can see that the predominant population here over the time point is the particles that are above 5.6 micron in size. Again, with the zeta potential, there is a slight change um, versus the sodium chloride, but it's very, it's very minute. So again, this would infer that Entrapment is the major mechanism by how this uh, adjuvant actually interacts with proteins. So just to briefly conclude, um, in the sodium chloride, Agifos has much larger, is much larger in terms of particle size than uh, the positively charged L hydrogel. Um, an important point about zeta potential, um, both of the adjuvants actually when they're administered into R10 medium become negatively charged. And so, therefore, zeta potential is not really, um, it's, not re it's independent of how the cells would actually uh, see these materials. So it doesn't really kind of matter too much because there's been a lot of information about how zeta potential being positively charged or negatively charged can influence uptake. But in this case, they're both negatively charged, so there really is no effect here. And following the administration of our hydrogel into the R10 medium, there is a larger abundance of uh, particles that are available for phagocytosis, and this becomes particularly significant um, in terms of cell loading. So you'd expect to see more alhydrogel within cells than agifos. So what about the cellular response to aluminium adjuvants? So now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Matthew Mould, who will give you a bit more information about this. Mm -hmm.